Welcome to Wax Sun Weekly. Wax Sun Weekly is the official Western Athletic and ASUN Conference podcast of FCS Fans Nation. Wax Sun Weekly is hosted by Dustin Helton, Brandon Owens, and Will Siler. Welcome back, FCS Fans Nation, to another episode of Wax Sun Weekly. And uh, we have a special guest, or we did have a special guest with us. But uh, I don't think he can hear us. So we're just going to keep rolling. And when he gets back, it'll be great. Um, If you caught a glimpse of his face, it's uh, Matt Frazee, who we will give a proper introduction to. We can hear him perfectly. I know, we can hear him just fine. That was weird. But uh, while we're waiting on him, we'll just kind of get going. Um, How are you guys doing? Other than being like super kill. I, you know, I am enjoying this. Uh, (laughs) This is probably my favorite uh, favorite five minutes of recording because this is you know for those that don't know this is take two <laughs> of doing this oh my gosh uh, I, I wish well, you could see i wish you could see behind the scenes because watching him uh try to get his stuff fixed is pretty amazing <laughs> <laughs> that's oh god okay um, oh, is he back oh there he hey. is we're running on a phone <laughs> running on a phone there, he there is. we go well, hey, let's give uh, Matt a proper intro. We're joined this week by a fourth box, and that is the Podfather, the admin of FCS Fans Nation, unbiased Bison admin, may I say, um, Matt Frazee. So, Matt, how the heck are you, man? I'm better than my internet or audio issues or what the heck is going on. <laughs> you can consider this take three of me attempting to join you guys tonight, but thanks for putting up with North Dakota internet. It must be dealing with the cold weather we're having. Dude, thank you so much for having me on, guys. Um, this is something that Rev would not give up on, thankfully, with my busy life and kids and everything. He's like, dude, we're getting you on the show. So I'm glad we actually got able to make it work. I love listening to you guys each week. Your guys' chemistry and banter is always so much fun to listen to. So I'm excited to be a part of it, even if it's on an iPhone due to some technical issues. Yeah, thank we're, the true, we're the true B team. Yeah, we just wanted our video <laughs> reviews. That's it for me. Oh, we, well, uh, yeah, we just look forward to the YouTube comments every week telling exactly us they were goofballs. And also, since you know Matt's on here, we're going to get some pull from folks from Minnesota and North Dakota. So I just slowly want to hold this up for everybody who's watching on YouTube for all the folks from Minnesota. Just a reminder of what happened to your hockey team, where they went. It's right here. My favorite thing to do when, when, when NDSU plays in Frisco is to go out Friday night wearing a Dallas Stars jersey especially this one, and just rub it in their faces. It's something I do every time, and they get so pissed off about it. It But is North Dakota State going to be in Frisco this year? That's that's a very true point. (laughs) Hey, we'll talk about that here in (laughs) the middle section. As a proud Central Arkansas and Stephen and Boston fan, I don't really care if India is there. Why? That's right. Hey, you picked the two better teams this weekend, so... (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. Well, hey, uh, it was a, a classic week, really, um, in the A-Sun and the WAC. We had some shootouts um, last week that we'll get to here in just a minute. But uh, just to kind of gloss over some results, Southeastern in the game of the week uh, knocked off Jacksonville State on homecoming. That was a big surprise. None of us got the game of the week right. Didn't even have to update the standings. Eastern Kentucky and North Alabama in one of those ESPN instant classic games. Eastern Kentucky took care of the Lions at home. Kennesaw State uh, in overtime took care of Tennessee Tech. Um, SFA knocked off Southern Utah uh, there in Cedar City. Tarleton only beat Southwest Baptist by 14. I know Rev is excited about that. Uh, And then Sam Houston in just a spectacular display of offense um, mustered up 18 points and knocked off Utah Tech 18 to 13. So uh, I really want to talk about Southeastern and Jacksonville State because obviously none of us expected it because none of us got the game of the week right. Um, Really, Brandon, I want to hear your assessment of the game because I know you were there. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you were texting us. You're a little heartbroken. So uh, what 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 went wrong with the Gamecocks? It looked like really statistically they got dominated. He was running the same dead gun play about 500 different times, and almost everybody in that freaking stadium was yelling at Rich Rod. Oh my God, I have never seen coaching like this since John Gross left. John Gross was the only other one that literally ran the same play for almost an entire game. Oh so my since, gosh. Since last year. <laughs> Sorry, I had to but, throw that in there. So Rich Rod hasn't done this like, he did it last week. Last week? Did we play you and A last week? Yeah, we did play you and A last week. Yeah. Two okay, so like last week and this week, um, they real like the media really honed in on Rich Rod having a tendency to run the same as exact play, but in different formations. Now, granted, running it in different formations can confuse a team, but if they pick up on, okay, this person's getting the ball every single time, running it up the middle. They're going to stop that play. Why not change it up? I was I was so frustrated. Me and the entire stadium were very frustrated. So you very know, frustrated. So you know when you first start, you know, dating somebody and it's magical and all these new things and it's wonderful and great and then after a while they start doing the same shit over and over again. That's where yes. you are for Rich Rod now. That's where you are. And everybody has warned you about Rich Rod. And we said that that you know what you're going to get with Rich Rod. And this is notorious Rich Rod. This is what he does. The difference is that he, he'd been able to win doing it. And he's kind of done this year. But if you ever notice whenever he's coaching, he he doesn't maintain, if you, especially like year over year, he doesn't maintain winning seasons. And it's because he does the same thing. And so I'd like to congratulate you on being out of the, uh, out of the uh, oh, we're, we're just so happy together sort of phase. And welcome to Rich Rod. <sighs> I, 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 if he does this moving forward, maybe it's time to like kick him to the curb, especially moving to the FBS. You definitely got to consider though, like the players he's working with, they're not fully his at this time. And he's probably got some adjustments to make there and bad games do happen. He's probably getting the staff underneath him. Um, so I think it is a good hire for now. And JSU, they, they kind of have to do the James Madison approach a little bit where, you know, it's supposed to be a little bit of a bumpy ride into transition. And of course this was against an FCS opponent, but there's definitely going to be some growing pains. I think like the Dukes have learned that the last two weeks, you know, just superior talent's not going to win out. Um, you're going to have to make good coaching adjustments and things like that. So I think Rich Rod is a good transitional coach who knows if he's your long-term play, but um I wouldn't say that one bad game totally throws him off the edge. You still have a pretty established guy who's been around the, the realm a little bit. Yeah, there's no doubt that, I mean, obviously with his FBS experience, I don't think Jacksonville State can say that he's not the guy for right now. Um, but like you said, who knows down the road? Because I don't know. I don't see him wanting to stay at Jacksonville State for you know too long either. So uh, we talked about the shootout, Eastern Kentucky, North Alabama. This one was so fun. And I really thought North Alabama was going to finally like break through because they've been really close a few times this year. And even though some teams have pulled away maybe at the end, uh, like, like Jacksonville State uh, pulled away toward the end of that one, um, I really thought they were going to get one late when they were up. But Eastern Kentucky scored. I wanted, It was less than a minute left. It might have been like eight seconds uh, to win the, win the game. And then North Alabama had to like lateral it on a kickoff. But um, – Man, that one hurts for North Alabama. They're 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 wounded right now, and their fan base is pretty upset. So, um, did anybody watch that one other than me? I, I did. Yeah, yeah, and some interesting thing. I don't want to steal from a certain channel, but you want to talk about some fat stats in this game? They're absolutely insane. So for uh, uh, North Alabama, Noah Walters, seventeen and twenty six, two hundred fifteen yards, three touchdowns, and a pick. Uh, Shanderick Powell is the running back. He had 29 carries for 218 yards, three touchdowns. Um, and they had another 63 yards receiving. And then on the EKU side, the 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 the, the guy I've been touting all year, Parker McKinney, uh, 22 33 for 310 yards, five touchdowns. And then <clears throat> receiving wise, you had Cornelius McCoy, who uh, did a seven for 145, three touchdowns. Like just insane offensive numbers in this game. Um, 
it's a shame that somebody had to lose, to be honest with you. Like there's no other way to put it like it, it, because they both, both teams played their hearts out. And honestly, North Alabama should have won that game. I was just about to say that they, they outplayed Eastern. Um, I mean, you can't say they outplayed them defensively because they did give up 56 points, but uh, offensively they did outplay them. So kind of unfortunate that they didn't get a win. Well, um, when you when you lose in the penalty and turnover categories, like what what can you what can you say? That was kind of the difference. One turnover for North Alabama and none for Eastern. And I mean, pretty much every drive other than that was a score. So um, that obviously came into play. So uh, let's see other notable results. Uh, man, Kennesaw, they're continuing to struggle. Uh, and I kind of want to hear Matt's thought on this because I know there's been a lot of national talk about Kennesaw State over the last few years and whether the offense that they run, the style of play they have is sustainable to be successful on the national uh, stage. And I think we're seeing maybe it's not. Yeah, Kennesaw is an interesting program because I don't think anybody would have expected them to have the success of the FCS they did right away. I mean, talk about coming out. Uh, like thunder and lightning and just striking quick and fast was right into conference championship competition, getting into the playoffs. People talk about them with seating. People forget the year that they lost to SDSU to set up that NDSU SDSU semifinal. You know, they were the home team. They were the top seed and their quarterback went down and the SDSU went down there and got what would be seen as an upset. So in terms of that FCS level success, they were pretty close to a semifinal appearance within their first six, seven years as a program within its existence, which is nuts. So I think everybody kind of looked at that Atlanta market with Kennesaw and was just like, hey, this is a team that eventually is going to be looking into the FBS realm. But I don't think any of us predicted uh, basically two gigantic rounds of realignment going all the way into Kennesaw's area and pulling them up into the FBS ranks. Uh, Rev has said it so many times, and I've seen you guys on Twitter echo these things. Um, this is on brand with CUSA. They're they're going to pull for markets, right? They're not going to pull a Sun Belt and be like, listen, we're going to try to get geography and fan interests and passion between rivalries. They're just going to pull the markets and pull people out. In terms of Kennesaw, I, I take the take, man. If you can make the jump, make the jump. Um, even if you feel like it's going to be in a bad position, I think we deal with a lot of social media stuff where people, they read something, they look at it, and it's quick reaction. It just reminds me of like the Sun Belt being the worst conference ever in the FBS. That's trash and was going to fold and nobody wanted to join. You never know what the future is going to look like. It is hard from Matt Brown to the other individuals that are involved in conference realignment heavily, kind of your Adam Schefter types of realignment. They say it is so hard to kill a conference. It is very, very difficult with the backing and money to kill a conference. So Kennesaw is an example of me for perfect partners. But CUSA, they want the Atlanta market. They're going to build from the ground up. And I think Kennesaw is wise, wise to take it, honestly. It's fun to laugh at on social media and everything else, but who knows what 10 years down the line looks like. So, uh, Kennesaw, right now you're on the struggle bus. If you want to know my opinion on the triple option, complete trash in 2022. Uh, throw it out. It's never going to win you a championship. It might put butts in the uh, in the seats. Maybe your culture, your fans really like it, but it's not going to be a long-term solution. So hate the triple option. Love that Kennesaw is moving up for their fans and their program, no matter how it looks in the first five, six years. And um, this season, ooh, I got to say, I predicted them to be a lot better. Definitely had them as a playoff team, and I could not have been more wrong. So big swing and a miss up here from North Dakota on the Owls this season. Very surprising to me. Yeah, it was. I think everybody had that same feeling about Kennesaw. They were predicted to win the A-Sun, and as of now, it does not look like they are in contention for that. So, Rev, what what's I, up? What I wonder, though, is you look at their, if you look at their scores week over week, you know, I mean, granted, they got boat raced by UCA. But it seems like each week their offense is slowly but surely pr- producing a little bit more than it had the previous week. And so I'm wondering if they're trying to, if they are slowly figuring out a way to compete without depending on the triple triple option because of the, the rules that now impact the triple option. And if that's the case, then maybe that's going to be a, a great help for them 
next season as they transition out. Um, but they have got to improve their defense because their defense is a joke. That is their defense uh-huh. is atrociously bad, and it's going to be a sieve whenever they move up to Conference USA unless they get that shut down pretty quick. Yeah, Rev, shocking. When I was going over statistics of Kennesaw, uh, total defense ninetieth. And here's the thing with Kennesaw: they they never ever, in my opinion, got sort of Sam Houston um, reputation a little bit, where they're like, oh, it's all offense. And the defense doesn't hold up and they have to score. They were always kind of portrayed as like a, obviously they're a triple option team. So time of possession is important, but they were a balanced squad. Like they were always viewed as a team with both sides of the ball. They're going to stop you on defense, hold the ball, run their triple option. Man, that defense has not played well this year. It's actually just shocking how bad it's been. So, and an offense that's not much better in terms of their production. So are you surprised by that at all this year? I mean, it's really crazy. It surprises me that their defense is where it is. Um, it, it just just because you know they they've been going around with you know they had been boasting about how good of a defense that they have, and so it does kind of surprise <laughs> me to see where they're. The fact to see if they're 90th is I, that does shock me a little bit. But you know, if you're playing a more controlled possession game where you're keeping your defense off the field because you're running the ball, you're controlling the clock, then it makes sense that now that you're having to throw the ball more with Shepard that your um your your weaknesses that you may not have had come out are now coming out because your defense is out on the field and they're being more exposed for sure and it's not shocking when you look at them they're like the 12th 12th overall rushing offense in the fcs and their total offense is in like the 70th 70th range that's like ndsu ish ndsu is like total offense fourth uh or i'm sorry rushing offense fourth total offense you know can drop down to like the 30s. It's not as drastic, but like it's because the passing offense just is such an offset and Kennesaw's not throwing the ball a lot. But that defensive statistic in almost the hundredth range is really, really shocking. So not gonna win a lot of games that way. I will give uh Kennesaw one um like benefit of the doubt with their defense. They had a lot of injuries early in the year and they still haven't gotten a lot of those back. And if you listen to uh, coach Bohannon in his um, press conferences, I was listening to him UCA week and um, somebody just asked, they're like, how are we injury wise? And he like kind of looked down and he was like, guys, we're banged up. He said, especially defensively, which that's no excuse to have a bottom, you know, 20 defense in the country, but still um, just, you know, kind of playing devil's advocate there. They are a little, um, banged up on the defensive side of the ball. But uh, SFA, Rev, your Jacks took down the T-Birds, the Thunderbirds of Southern Utah. And yes, the the bobblehead is, that's awesome. That is immaculate. Uh, God, I wish we had bobbleheads. That'd be clutch. Um, in the corner, it'll be perfect. <laughs> um Rev, so what did you see? That was a uh, that was another game that went down to the wire. Uh, I was watching it live, and uh, that was a classic. Yeah, again, it's sort of the same thing. You, you look at the first quarter, SFA seemed a little bit hesitant going out um, when it came to moving the ball. And then the second quarter, they turned it on, scoring 21 unanswered points, and they didn't look back from there. Um, Self looked pretty good. Yeah, he did have a pick, but he still threw for almost 300 yards at three touchdowns. Wembley had another 100-yard game. Um, I think he had 100, 138 on the ground, no touchdowns, um, though. And then receiving-wise, you want to talk about a stat. Xavier Gibson, 10 receptions, 256 yards, two touchdowns. Like, just obliterated the Southern Utah um, defense. I think what changed the momentum more than anything, though, is uh, we were – SFA was on their – I think they were on their, the 25 or 30. I can't remember exactly. might have been the 25. Fourth down, fake punt. Ran it for 40 yards. Um, that completely, I think, changed the momentum of the game. Because I think had they punted at that point, Southern Utah would have had their would have had their their mojo still going, might have driven and scored again. SFA ended up scoring on that drive, and that completely just turned around all the momentum. It's you know, similar to what we saw happen with SFA and Jacksonville State whenever S, uh, SFA was up, and then Jacksonville State started making uh insane plays. Uh same thing happened. So, you know. SFA is sitting at five and three, and I don't think anybody's surprised, honestly surprised by the fact that they're at five and three. Maybe they thought they would have had another win versus JSU or, or Sam Houston, or maybe some folks thought Louisiana Tech, but five, I mean, five and three is a 
with Utah Tech remain Utah Tech UCA and the return game of Abilene Christian remaining, SFA is in a good spot to get into the playoffs if they can win out. That's just the thing. They just have to they have to win out. But I don't I, I you know I think they're sitting out now they're, they're sitting outside a lot of people's top twenty five. But you look at some of these bottom twenty five teams and uh, the or the the teams in the bottom part of the top twenty five and you can easily switch some of them out with SFA. I think SFA, if they get another win this week, is going to start falling into, besides the coach's poll, I think the other polls, the polls that actually matter, um, you're going to start seeing more uh, more votes uh, for them. And who knows? Like, like I said, they went out. They're going to, they're not, I mean, they're going to play on Thanksgiving weekend, but they might be hosting a game. But I was really, I was really impressed with the way that they, they managed to hang on and win. Southern Utah, you know, Kyler craps on them all the time, but man, they have had a turnaround under Coach Fitzgerald. They're looking a lot better this year. They've improved on their win total, and I think they're going to be a team to watch over the next couple of years in the WAC. Yeah, Kyler's always hitting on them pretty heavy. Jamie loves them because their coach, I believe, is a James Madison product, or at least was associated with the program, and he's very high in the Thunderbirds and where they're going. Rev, I was curious on SFA, and I was very high in them in the preseason. I picked them as a semifinal team. I picked, I saw all the pieces of, of SFA. I related it to my prediction of Sam Houston in the spring, where I was like, the season before, all the factors aligned. The defensive points per game given up, a returning stud wide out, the quarterback, the coach, the lines. We could dive into a lot of it. I know for sake of time, we won't, but I'm curious, last year, you guys gave up 17.9 points per game. And I was like, dang, that's like the defense that's going to be there. And I've got you a little bit, I lost my mask off, a little bit above 29, 29 and a half points per game you guys are giving up. What has been such the change on the defense for SFA? And why is that the Achilles heel right now? Well, when you have a a great uh, defensive staff under uh, Coach McFarland, they get poached. And that's what happened. The the, the defensive or defensive coordinator got poached. Uh, a lot of the, the 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 like the the we I think we have four new defensive coaches this year, and three of them went to Louisiana Tech, and one of them is now at TCU. Um, so the base they basically got raided. We also Reverend Randall hasn't been playing. We did lose some players. So I mean, Coach Carthel said the best. He's like, we're back defensively. We're back to where we were in 2019 because we're learning. We're running brand new schemes. The new coach. Um, I feel like the defense, here's the thing though. I would think that you would see the defense be more tight as the year has gone on, but I don't think it's there yet. I think what you've seen is the offense gelling better and being able to keep the team in games versus depending on the defense to win a game. Um, and, and, you know, I, I didn't think Southern Utah would would score 38 points on them. I figured they would score probably in the high twenties. I was kind of surprised at how many points they put up, but I think that's what's going to keep SFA from being a semifinal team if they make it into the playoffs. I think they're a first round. They might win their first round game, but then they're going to end up having to go to Brookings or go to, um, you know, to uh, Bozeman or something. And that's where they're going to probably, you know, have one of those games where it's like 54 to 10 sort of loss because the defense just isn't there yet because they're basically starting over. And it stinks because we're going to lose a lot of great guys uh, this year. Uh, you know, we're going to lose uh, BJ Tom. He's going to, uh, he's going to be gone. Miles search will be gone. Like there's a lot of folks that we're going to lose on the defensive side of the ball, but thankfully coach Carthel has had two, as they say, two top recruiting classes on defense over the past couple of years. So I think there's enough depth and talent to where it, a lot doesn't fall off, but they have to be able to learn the scheme. And the biggest struggle they've had has been stopping the run. That's where they're, that's where they have, that's where they have struggled. Um, and that's what I'm, I hope, I'm hoping as they get through the rest of the season, get into the off season. I hope that's what they spend a lot of their off season focus on is being able to stop the run because the pass defense is pretty decent. Um, they do, they do a good job of keeping folks who can sling the ball from slinging the ball. Like they did a good job controlling Bo Allen and Tarleton. Um, you know, so I just, you know, we, I was high on them too. I think the problem was everybody was high on them, not because of who they beat, but because of who they lost to and by how many points last year. And that was sort of the the I think that was sort of the, the telling thing. I mean, with almost almost beating Texas Tech, you know, one point loss to Sam Houston, uh, a, a close I think it was like what a four point loss to Jacksonville State. Like you know, they they folks looked at those numbers and said, wow, they can hang in with these guys, and and gave them the benefit of the doubt based off that ba- instead of basis on who they beat. So 
So yeah, um, that's what it is. It's it's just they lost a lot on defense. They lost their coaches. The they lost great coaches, but see what happens over the next couple of years with the new staff that they have. Yeah, it's interesting. 99th in rushing defense. So that's like, you know, that's such a Achilles heel. And, you know, you go up to Bozeman or SDSU, they're just going to pound the rock in front of you left and right. But in, in terms of that playoff thing, it is interesting because, okay, let's say they get to, let's say you win your next three games. That would be sorry to you, Will, because um, that would be a, a victory over UCA. Um, but if they win their next three games, you're looking at a record of eight and three. But it gets interesting because, you know, they played a they played Warner at home and beat them a 17.6 billion to zero. Um, but that won't count in the committee's eyes as a W because it's not an FCS win. So you're going to be looked at at seven and three with one of the losses being FBS. So it's like, OK, we're not going to hold the FBS loss against them, but they only have seven FCS wins. I think they're going to need a little bit of chaos, especially with all those big sky teams performing and. I think the Missouri Valley continuing to be not as great would be beneficial for an SFA and the CAA kind of eating itself alive in the last few weeks could help you out as well. So it'll be interesting. It should be fun. Don't. Yeah. For, yeah. I was going to say what I think you're going to see is one, if SFA wins out, they're going to get the auto, they're going to get the AQ. That's what I think is you're going to see is happen. But the other thing too, you, you do talk about the one loss, but how are they counting Jacksonville state and Sam though? Because they're not FCS teams. They what? have more than FCS scholarships. So it depends on how the committee views that. Does the committee view that as FCS losses or not? Because if they don't, they're they're undefeated against the FCS at that point. So yeah, that's... It's, very, it's very interesting to see what they decide to do whenever it comes to playoff time. But if they went out, they're going to get the AQ. They would they would I think they would have every they would have record, they'd have conference record, and they'd have the power pole, which they're which they're on top of already. So I, I think that it's almost theirs to lose in that regard. That's yep, totally fair. Yeah, that's the question I have for um, SLU because they beat us this past weekend. How how are people going to view that win? So I I don't know. Maybe this win could give the Southland two teams. I don't I don't know. Yeah, they that ASUN with the transitioning teams and the way it's set and everything. It's like it feels like the spring season a little bit. You know <laughs> how they're setting everything up. It's just kind of weird rules and weird things, but. It honestly makes it a little more, a little more fun, a little more intriguing. So. Uh, don't worry about FA two way it's set up. They don't have to win out to get the AQ at all. Um, if they, let's see, they're undefeated in countable games right now. Um, and so even if they drop one, I don't think there's anybody else that only has one loss in countable games. And so, say you lose to UCA in two weeks, um, even if we get the a sun tiebreaker you get the whack tiebreaker i believe it would still go to you either way um and so i mean like you said it's theirs to lose but it's not like they have to continue to win just to get the aq bid like the playoff outlook for sfa right now is pretty good just looking at the next three games even if they go two and one so um and while we're you know this is a perfect time really i just loaded the wax sun power rankings in um so I'm going to throw those up right now and we'll look at SFA. They're still on top. Um, somehow Kennesaw moved up after a very suspect win over uh, Tennessee Tech. We moved down because we lost to the bye week, apparently. Uh, kind of throw Tarleton out of there. They they obviously don't count. Uh, you can throw Utah Tech out as well. Um, so, I mean, really, SFA is several links ahead of the pack right now. If you just look at the actual, like, value the numerical value of the power rating and so i'm interested to hear what you guys think about sfa is being viewed as undefeated in countable games but it's no secret their strength of schedule is not good and so i don't i don't think strength of schedule is going into this warren nolan power rating um at least it's not being weighted very heavy and so i'm kind of interested i'm I mean, i'm no mathematician um i don't know if maybe you guys I don't know what you all majored in. I know what Brandon majored in, but um, maybe you guys know more math than I do. But it seems like strength of schedule is not very important because, um, I mean, Austin P not a very good strength of schedule. Abilene, not. Eastern does. Eastern has a pretty good strength of schedule, but then they've lost a game or two. So uh, what, what's your guys' thoughts on the power rating this week? I think SFA is getting the benefit. I, I don't. I was going to say that because I don't know if they're – they shouldn't be counting the Warner game and Warner score, but I wonder if they're looking at just how, just what the the scores are and on 
wins. But even that doesn't make sense. Not many, with the exception of Charlton, SFA hasn't necessarily had a win that has been a dominating win over. You know, they came back against Alcorn. Abilene Christian was a last minute or last second field goal, right? So I don't, this is, but whenever we were talking about this since first came out, that's why I said this is the biggest load of crap I've ever heard in my life, utilizing something like this. You know, I, I've said this before, back when the BCS first started, one year Oregon got left out of the national championship, even though they were undefeated, and the coach from Oregon called the BCS a cancer. And and, it, it, and this, I'm not saying this is a cancer, but this is a, why you can't use you can't use you know this, this as a basis to figure out who your champion is um and I, I i've been trying to look at this power pole i can't figure it out i just honestly ignore it for the most part because i'm like this is this is garbage the one thing it does kind of show me though is that if sfa keeps going like they're going if abilene christian keeps going like they're going that game on november 19th is gonna probably decide who gets the aq out of the out of out of it i don't think it's anybody on the a sun side who's going to get it i think it's going to be sfa or Appling christian um and i think the the power pole does reflect that as well but other than that like that i can't figure out any rhyme or reason that how sfa is so dominating in the power pole right now it doesn't make any sense to me i was uh i don't know I, it just confuses me the, the one thing i have to keep telling myself is it's not going to come down to that because nobody's going to have a tie in countable games record because um like if you look at how many countable games SFA's play in versus like an Austin P because it, you take the ASUN champion you take the WAC champion you compare their countable records um and they're just not going to be the same for the most part um so it's really going to come down to you know who played an easier schedule in my opinion um so I don't know. It doesn't benefit some teams like Eastern Kentucky or like UCA, but it does benefit a team. I'm not going to say SFA is the only team that's played an easy schedule. Austin P hadn't played anybody either. I mean, look at their the best opponent they played. They got beat by 30, um, other than, say, Western Kentucky. But <clears throat> just an interesting thing here. Uh, as of today, SFA would be the auto bid, not because of the power ranking, but because they get the um, uh, record over UCA, which makes that head-to-head important but the head-to-head -head doesn't matter that's what's weird is that like if you play each other in the regular season that game doesn't matter if your record is better than if say we beat sfa but your record's better you get in so it's it's weird um i i wish they had done it differently maybe next year we'll just be one big conference and we'll play each other um which is another thing we're going to talk about and rev you're the um expert on all things kyler neal here so what uh what do you have to say to this man oh here we go lock and <laughs> the rev rant is on the way oh really? all right all right look look kyler neal little smurf ass can just uh it just piss off okay I, I get that everything compared to the big sky is trash. Totally understand that. But here's the thing you're missing. The only reason that the A Sun and the WAC this year are as bad as they are is because the team's backing out of, of the conference last minute. Okay. That completely screwed everybody's year up. Okay. If next year, if the WAC Sun becomes a true conference where they play each other each, uh, they actually play each other each week instead of doing what they're doing this year. Where we don't have to depend on a stupid ass power pole to try to help figure out who the, the champion is, you're going to see the WAC Sun move up ahead of other conferences in terms of strength. Will they be a Big Sky? No. Will they be a Missouri Valley in strength? No. But they they could form up like a Missouri Valley conference, and they could be you know they could be the fourth best conference in SCS. And you know what? That's okay. I mean, that's fine. That's enough to maybe get you multiple multiple bids. Um, I don't think the A Sun should abandon football i don't think the whack should abandon football i think they have to look at each other they need to partner up and they need to take uh greg uh what's it? greg gubbert the the a sun commission who's retiring they need to look at his replacement and say hey you know the the, the whack commissioner is not a football guy he's a basketball guy they're at the football media days so he's talking about basketball right so let the commission run it for all i care or get somebody else to run it as a football as like the mvfc has done just get somebody else to do it but I don't think it's 
it's going away. I don't think there was a question on on Matt on your show about if UCA was going to go back to original conference. The answer is no, UCA is not going back to the Southland because one, Teague doesn't want to go back to the Southland. It would EKU go back to the OVC? Probably not. I mean, there's a lot more benefit to being in these conferences than football. And that's what I think people forget when they look at this. The A Sun is better for basketball. The A Sun is better for baseball. The WAC is better for basketball. The WAC is better for baseball. There's all these other things that go into it. So, what they have to do is they have to say, hey, we're going to unite as a football conference. And they need to make sure that they get those schedules made, that they don't try to be separate. They share the AQ. They give it a nice name instead of the AQ 9 or 10. Give it give it something that makes it outshine that whatever the Southland's new name is going to be and go from there. Start fresh. But, but Kyler, love you, but your opinion was trash. I'm just going to say that. Your opinion is absolute trash. Matt, uh, I'm interested to hear your thoughts as a national uh, and unattached kind of from the WAC and A-Sun because I would say, uh, obviously, Brandon moving up to FBS, I think he still has maybe some ASUN bias that they shouldn't drop it. Um, and obviously, I do. So I want to hear what your thoughts are, because you're seeing it um, kind of objectively as opposed to us. So what what do you think the, the move is for the two conferences? You know, I my whole take on the whole thing is, number one, you, you got to get something figured out that makes sense. I mean, I think you guys just recognized it within the last 10 minutes. Anything that they're doing operationally within football, and it's not exactly the conference's fault. I mean, they're dealing with the fact that they're being poached from CUSA and rumor mills about Eastern Kentucky and other schools also sniffing up into that FBS realm. And that's not an easy thing to manage as a conference. So, but they definitely have to figure out operational stuff, I would say, next year and next year or two. Like, how many teams are we going to have? Are they all going to play each other? What's the conference schedule? What's the name of the conference? This whole power poll, other stuff is just like you guys said. It's an awful, awful idea. It feels like the spring season where the rules are made up and things are just thrown out there, and that's not good for anybody. I think it's a, I don't think that the A Sun should cut football and end anything. I don't think the Wax Sun, any sort of thing should be cut. This is a good opportunity for these programs in, geog- in the geography of where they exist to actually make a really good competitive conference. I like what Rev said about this is an opportunity to maybe sit in that uh, SOCON realm right now. You know, the SOCON is kind of what most people view as probably the fourth strongest conference that can see two teams jump in there into a 24-team playoff. Um, My big thing with the ASUN and all that is outside factors, man. I don't think that there's loyalty in any college football and I don't blame anybody for doing it. Nobody would not leave a job if they're going to triple your pay or triple your opportunities. Right? So what the ASA and WAC has to worry about is just poaching. You know, nobody in the big South was afraid to be like, Hey, that CAA looks pretty good. Peace out. I'm, I'm out of here, you know? And now the, they're looking around going, what the heck? NCA and T wasn't afraid to be like, See you to the standard celebration bowl. Okay, now we're going to the CAA. So I actually think the ASUN has a really good chance to survive and sustain itself if the outside factors actually stop. And the rumor mills from the Matt Browns and the others is that more of your guys' teams, like the Kennesaws all the way to Eastern Kentucky's, are the next ones that are being kind of sniffed at if the CUSA wants to expand. They're only going to be at 10 teams next year. Um, They were at nine until they added Kennesaw. So my takeaway is I'm not with Kyler where they would want to kill a conference just because things are looking rough. But I think you guys and the conference as itself will survive no problem if there's no more crazy realignment. I think you get I think it's correct where a lot of these established individuals, not individuals, established schools are not looking to go back southland. They're not looking to hop back in old conferences. They like where they're heading but they're not going to be afraid to move upwards if they get those opportunities. And that could cause people to get cold feet need to have just some sustainability. So my take is patience and we'll see what happens, but I wouldn't say that this conference should just fold and bail on football. There's already been a lot of money and investment put into it. So outside looking in, that's how I see it. And it would be pretty cool if they could compete with the SOCON and maybe the CAA and try to be one of those top tier conferences. So I uh, I think that 
it is kind of unfortunate, maybe fortunate, unfortunate, whatever you want to call it, that the schools that those conferences, uh, you know, attracted when they started football back, uh, being the whack in the ASUN, uh, were attractive to other FBS, con- like FBS conferences. And so it's like, for them, that's kind of a feather in their cap. Like, hey, look, we pulled these schools. And then it's it's nice that, you know, they were, it sucks for them, but it was also kind of cool. So it's a weird situation. But Brandon, I know you're like the expert on all things FBS realignment. So uh, what's the what's the rumor mill right now? Well, so yes, Eastern Kentucky is being floated around for Conference USA. Um, I've seen Delaware be mentioned after they release their plans for their football stadium. Um, I know what y'all think, but I've been seeing North Dakota State mentioned. Um, I've seen. <laughs> um, I've also seen SFA. I've also seen Tarleton. Like, I, I mean, I. I think out of those teams, your best bet is SFA, Tarleton, EKU, and probably Delaware if you want to stay geography. The only problem with North Dakota State, they check every single box minus their geography. They are on an island out there. So if you bring North Dakota State in, you're going to have to bring in probably other teams that you're not even considering. And I don't even think CUSA is considering something like that. Yeah, bringing in NDSU would be like bringing in, uh, it was one of the best things I've ever heard. And it was in the last few months, they go, you guys are the Hawaii that's connected. And I was like, wow, that stings, but damn, is it true? So um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what plays out. But in terms of the ASUN, uh, I think you guys do have something. When I look at the teams outside looking in, if I were in an NDSU tailgating tent and I said, they go, what's the ASUN? Let's just say it's a random fan. I said, oh, um, Kennesaw, well, Kennesaw is leaving it, but let's say at the time, right? Kennesaw is in it. Uh, Central Arkansas, they got the striped field. Uh, Jacksonville State was in it. You know, I started naming those teams. People go, oh, okay, yeah, yep, all right. Seems like a pretty good conference. So it'll be interesting to see once Jacksonville State, Sam Houston, Kennesaw are not involved, what the perception of it is. And hopefully it can sustain itself and do really well. But we'll have to see. So Matt, we we kind of talked about uh, you know kind of the the whack son and Husi as being the auto bid here, but let's take it a little bit further back as a whole for the FCS. I mean, I, I know you talked about this on 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 the the show some, but when you look at your teams that you think are going to make a deep run in the playoffs, who do you think it is? And then also the second thing, and Brandon did ask this question earlier with Southeastern Louisiana getting Jacksonville State and getting that that win, does that replace their loss to Texas a and Commerce? Does that help them in the eyes of the committee to potentially help the Southland get two in? Because, I mean, they have a win against Incarnate Word also. Um, and so I guess, you know, just from your unbiased, biased and admin perspective, how are you seeing the whole of SCS as we get through the back half of the season? Yeah, I said this last week that the FCS this year has turned from – the preseason most boring season of all time where NDSU is viewed as the 2013, 2018 and just walks into Frisco and wins it all too. I think since I've truly started paying attention to the FCS, probably around your 2009 range. Um, I, I think this is the most exciting year we have coming up for the playoffs. And I mean that because I understand how good SDSU looks and I understand that they beat NDSU I do not view them the same as I did in the spring. And I was so high in them in the spring. I saw them play NDSU and I was like, that's the best team in the FCS. And Sam Houston got the best of them and credit to him. That was a fun game to go to. Um, that was the only game that spring season in the bracket for the playoff challenge I got wrong was the final, final game. But I don't, I see all the way from your top six, eight teams having possibilities to be able to make runs and win games. And it wouldn't shock me from it for an incarnate word to actually, you know, make its way into Frisco. Montana State looks great, and I keep doubting them, but they're not the same team as they were last year. And, you know, everybody was so high on the Grizz, and the Grizz are down to two losses now. North Dakota State, if you put their resume against anybody else, it's trash. I mean, they're, the people they've played are not, the teams they beat are not good football teams. Um, SDSU definitely looks to be the most complete and a lot of credit to Rev on calling that before a lot of people did. 
Um, and beyond that, I just see so many teams that could actually have opportunities to win. I think there's a pretty drastic drop off after your top six or eight. But I came into the season saying Montana, SDSU, NDSU, bam, case closed. And it seemed that way early. But boy, I am seeing just a really fun FCS postseason coming up. Um, in terms of your uh, kind of secondary question to where could we see the offset and southeastern Louisiana? Um, well, thankfully, you know, it, it depends what your status is, right? Are you playing a Division II team, or will the committee just view it as an FCS win or an FCS loss? NDSU gets hammered on this all the time because uh, people go, well, you played Drake, but that'll actually count as an FCS win. That's crap. They're terrible. Well, NDSU pays them 200 k to come up, and they refuse to they refuse to schedule D2 teams just for that reason, because they know how the committee thinks. Um, that's playing chess instead of checkers. So at the end of the day, if you lose to an FCS team, it's an FCS loss. You know, it might be seemed as a weaker one, but the committee, I don't know if they dive that deep. Really, the question for two Southland, two ASUN bids, anything like that is going to be, what does the CEA, Missouri Valley, and Big Sky look like? I think Kyler's right. I think the Big Sky's getting five. Um, and then you got to take your, you know, 10, 11 auto bids amongst that. And you're almost up to 15, 16 teams there. The Missouri Valley is going to get two on top of, I say, let's say they get three total, right? You got your auto bid another two. Okay, crap. We're down to six spots. And let's just say the CAA gets three. All right. We're down to three. <laughs> and um, then you've got to look at things like Holy Cross and Fordham this year. We just talked about this in our podcast. Just, you know, a lot of us are going, heck yeah, I think another one of them should pop in. Well, now we're down to two. So just doing the math, I think early mistakes, and Jamie says it well, the laundry you wear, whether it's dirty or clean, that's still laundry and it still affects you, whether it was early in the season or late in the season. So I think it's going to be tough for southeastern Louisiana, but it's so simple right here on about to be Halloween to say that. When last year we did the mock playoff special on the, the FCS network, you know, and we plugged in teams, we did it the week before. And then I'm pretty sure like five of the teams we said were guaranteed to make it all lost in the last week and Florida A&M ran into the playoffs. So at the end of the day, we don't ultimately know. But I do have to say, guys, um, even if NDSU is not in the title this year, I, I don't think I've been this excited for Frisco in a long time because I have no clue who's going to win and get all the way to Frisco. I, I can see SDSU losing in Brookings. I can see Fargo uh, having an upset. I can see NDSU having to travel. Um, I can see Montana State getting beat because uh, they just lack the ability to pass the ball. You, and, you know, offensive lines are not as big and dirty as they used to be. Man, I don't know. So long story short, I am really, really excited for the FCS playoffs. And I got to be honest, uh, I was thinking it would be very boring this year. And I'm glad it's not. Even as a Bison fan, I'm very excited for what it looks like. So, Frisco could have some very new fan bases in town that haven't been there. Um, Sac State looks really good right now. Um, mm -hmm. they, that'd be fun to see the Hornets in Frisco. That's the team I'm very high on right now. Well, and I think everybody is now because they've shown that, I mean, they're a complete football team. Um, and then yeah, I'm just kind of looking at the FCS broadcast media top 25, which if you haven't seen, go, uh, look at that on FCS fans nation, Twitter or Facebook, uh, even down to like Chattanooga and who knows is Holy Cross good enough to, you know, make a run somebody like Chattanooga who people aren't talking about maybe, but, um, they're playing well, they looked really good against Mercer. So that would be really fun. Still Chuck Fattanooga. <laughs> that defense is good. Chattanooga's defense is playing really, really well. They're 12th in the nation. They have a top 40 offense as well. And if you get balance in there, you've got a shot. So um, Chattanooga was a team that our podcast was not talking a lot about. And it took that win over Mercer for us to finally maybe give them some recognition. Mocks are playing good, man. But I don't know. It's just we see how big home field advantage is. So for a South Dakota state to keep winning and be in Brookings or for Montana state to win the brawl of the wild at the end, this is what gets interesting is if Sac state's undefeated, SDSU's got one loss, Montana state's got one loss, two loss NDSU. Obviously NDSU is the fourth in that, but even like, Chattanooga Chattanooga comes in there. I mean, this, I am not a seeding 
and I'm not a committee hater, actually. I think the committee does a really, 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 really good job for a 2014 playoff. I think they typically get six seeds spot on, great. One seed that's questionable but understandable. And they typically have one miss. And then out of 24 teams, there's always one or two that people hate that aren't in. But a 2014 playoff is huge. It's not as cut and dry as a 14-18 playoff. So I think based off of how they put things, typically stuff kind of works itself out. And that's to include, uh, people always say like, well, JMU gets a favor, NSU gets a favor. I always ask them back, can you justify why it's not, why, justify why not? And typically I don't really get a response. So I think the committee does a good job. And I think they're going to have a tough task this year. It'll be interesting. What is crazy to think is your top four seeds this year could be anybody that is not named Montana, Montana State, uh, NDSU, and SDSU. That is crazy to think. It, it'll all depend on these final three weeks. I, I am very confident SDSU wins out. Um, I think Montana State, I've doubted them, actually does win out as well. Sac State's the outlier, man. If they're undefeated, they've got Idaho and Weber State next. I don't see how the committee doesn't give them the number one. Kyler and I disagree on that, but um, we'll have to see how it plays out. Well, here's another thing you got to consider about Chattanooga. If they win out, they're going to be undefeated against the FCS. But they don't have an FBS win. Sacramento State does, and that's going to vault them up. So you'd see Chattanooga probably get a top uh, a five or higher seed, but – they wouldn't be. See, they would. They wouldn't be above a team like South Dakota State, especially if South Dakota State finishes out the rest of the year. And well, I don't know, even but, if they're undefeated, I to me that resume two top fifteen wins. That's good enough for me to give them a, the four. I could see Chattanooga. You know, there of course has to be other things that occur, but the the thing to remember big with the committee is. Uh, I don't agree with this, and I don't think anybody really does. They're going to take quality wins at the time of the game. So they're going to view a Missouri State for an SDSU as a quality win. Uh, Missouri State is trash, and I'm glad my prediction with that came true. Uh, But they're going to look at that as SDSU as a quality win, NDSU as a quality win. And so when you look at like a Sac State, if they were undefeated, they're going to have Weber, they're going to have Idaho, they're going to have Montana, plus they're going to have an FBS win, plus undefeated, plus Big Sky Champs. So really, it's those out-of-time quality wins that's really going to play a big factor. Um, But Chattanooga, you're right, undefeated against the FCS. I could see them be in that four or five spot. And if NDSU, you know, they might be sitting there with just a quality win over, I guess it could be UND, maybe at this point. Uh, So you could see Chattanooga maybe get bumped above them. But one last thing I'll say in it for the sake of time is sometimes being a lower seed doesn't hurt. Um, see Montana State last year. So as the eighth seed. So uh, Matt, for, real quick before we go to the the, the, the look at it next week, um, <clears throat> I know people like to ask which seeded team you know do you think won't perform. But here's my question for you: Who do you think gets Lehigh this year or McNeese? Who do you think has the 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 great record, but yet the committee leaves them out for some odd reason? Boy. Um, I think how, yeah, how can you almost not point to either a SOCON team that I think has been a pretty competitive conference this year? Like Mercer, of course, just took a big ding, but it's you, you can't just be super high on Mercer and appreciate how well they were playing and then just drop them like a hard hat. But is it almost too predictable to see the Fordham and Holy Cross thing playing out where there's just like some CAA team that is eight and four or Some big, the fifth big sky team will piss people off and Fordham and Holy Cross. One of them is going to end up, you know, not getting the auto bid. So I think you're going to look into a league like that, or possibly your second to third SOCON team. That's really going to make you upset. Southeastern Louisiana. There's another one that could kind of make people upset if they don't get in, but undoubtedly it's going to come from, what is considered the big three getting one extra little you and I style team and everybody else wanting, uh, you know, the Simpsons pitchforks walking down the street. So that would be my prediction for it. Just based off of history and every year we kind of see it. So. Yeah. I'll, I'll even throw another one out there. Abilene Christian. Yeah. I mean, 
honestly, like when, especially what happens against that SFA game there at the end of the season. So it'll be interesting, man. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we will be doing that uh, mock playoff special. We kind of have it down to a science now, but we will be doing that as a live show the week before where we will predict the final week of games that actually matter. And then we will act like we are the committee and place the playoff teams. What's always interesting about that is you could probably do it right now and realize there's probably only 35 teams you're even going to consider right now, which is pretty crazy. So, Well, gentlemen, it is that time of the week to start looking at some upcoming games for the week and make our game day picks. And then we will pick our game of the week. So this week, Charleston Southern making the trip to Kennesaw for what I think is Kennesaw's like fourth straight home game, which in my opinion sucks. That As an FCS, like whatever. As a fan base, that sucks. Jacksonville State traveling to the fort, play Austin P. North Alabama making the trip to Conway to play UCA, Utah Tech at SFA, Abilene at North Dakota, and then Sam Houston at Tarleton. And then our game of the week is a... Uh, Nice matchup between Eastern Kentucky and Southeast Missouri. So we'll start with uh, Charleston Southern and Kennesaw, which um, that's kind of interesting because Charleston Southern, uh, struggling program, Kennesaw also struggling this year. Um, but I'll just throw my pick out there. I don't see um, – I think Kennesaw is starting to figure a few things out um, offensively. I know they're banged up, defense sucks, but uh, I think they do beat – the Bucks of Charleston Southern. Yeah, Charleston Southern's one and six this year. They haven't. They're they're only wins against Bryant. They haven't competed against anybody this year. Honestly, I think Kennesaw State takes this one easily. I, I guess we can be really boring on this one, but there, I just don't see how Kennesaw at home is going to lose to Charleston Southern. I don't care what kind of struggles they've had. Charleston Southern is a bad football team this year. So give me the Owls, hooty hoo. Yeah. Kennesaw. <laughs> Brand's like, yep. <laughs> it sucks being the fourth one to go because it's like, ah, oh, well, uh, this was pretty agreeable. Yep. Uh, Jacksonville State coming off the loss to Southeastern playing Austin P, who uh, is coming off a bye week. So uh, had two weeks to prep for the Gamecocks, which um, I think helps uh, to especially – an offense like Jacksonville State, and then you see a game like Southeastern, you can scheme them up pretty good after a bye week. Um, at home, I think Austin P's um, fan base will come out for that one. So uh, I'm going to go with Jacksonville State. I think they uh, they get back on track. Yeah, Austin P hadn't played anybody. Uh, I was actually just talking to the guy that runs um, crap, what's it, uh, Gov Nation on Twitter. Uh, he DM'd me and asked if we were uh, – uh, doing a podcast this week. I was like, we're recording right now. So he's going to hate me. Um, but <laughs> I think Jacksonville State gets back on track uh, this week after a really disappointing loss. Um, I disagree. Uh, I think the fact that Rich Rod has proven that he's not going to change anything on offense, um, he'll still run the same exact play in just different formations. Um I think Austin P will actually get the win in this one. And last time Jacksonville played in Clarksville, we got our butts handed to us. Austin P still has our number. So give me the governors in Clarksville. I just don't see how um, I, I have to go. And I hit Brennan. You just, well, I picked the same thing. I got to go with Austin P fourth total ranked defense in the FCS is not some sort of mistake. And I was thinking about leaning towards Jacksonville state, but Brandon Owens, unfortunately, the way you've talked to me about coaching decisions and the offense specifically, you go up against the top five FCS defense, you know, in the realms of South Dakota state, Delaware, Jackson state, and especially with Austin P being at home. So tip of the hat, give me the govs in this one. Yeah, Austin P's biggest slip up this year was against Central Arkansas. Other than that, I mean, they hung in with Western Kentucky. They've, you know, they beat e, uh, EKU, who we honestly, I think a lot of us thought that EKU would get that dub. I mean, they are a really solid defensive team. And 
<clears throat> they've had, like you said, they've had a week off. They've had time to watch Rich Rod run the same damn play for a week. You know, so if he decides to do that, they can easily scheme against it. Sorry, two weeks in a row. I was trying to be nice about your relationship with Rich Rod, but you know, I guess you're really in the infighting stage now, which is a shame. Maybe he'll buy you flowers or something. But anyway, I digress. I, it's really hard for me to. I, I trusted you, Jacksonville State. I trusted you last week against the Lions, and you let me down. So you know what? Let's go pee. I will say this: uh, their defense, yes, is top five in the country. But just listen to who they like. The teams that they've had really good defensive performances: Presbyterian, Mississippi Valley State, Alabama A and M. Murray State. So, I mean, those are some of the worst programs in the FCS. And then, sure, they held Eastern Kentucky to 20, which is, you know, a very formidable offense. Uh, Parker McKinney uh, is slinging the ball this year. But, man, I mean, you take the UCA game out, and their strength of schedule is really, really bad. Take Their defense would be number one in the country if you take the UCA game out um, because I think we had, like, almost 600 yards offense and obviously 50 points. So uh, I don't know. I, it just has, I don't know. You get, it's kind of like when you get an NDSU coming off a loss, which I know Jacksonville state's not NDSU, but um, I think coming off a loss that was as disappointing as that one, they get it done. So, all right, moving on, we have uh, North Alabama making the trip to the stripes to play UCA. And before we get into anything, uh, I got to I gotta throw this on there. So the last time these two programs played was in 2005. Um, and I think, I sh- did I show this to you, Rev? Did I show it last week? Okay. Uh, I didn't put it on the podcast though. So um, I was seven years old. I had just turned seven. And UNA and UCA was the Gulf South Conference game of the week. And it was on uh, CSS, which was a TV network that did the GSC game of the week. And, um, I was on TV and that's me. No. <laughs> so, uh, I thought I'd throw that out there. Cause this is a blast from the past. Uh, dude. my dad made me that sign. I think I've still got it. And I think I'm going to bring it to the game. Oh, uh, dude, so. that is dope. Man. Uh, oh, we need to, we need these for Frisco. Dude, this is <laughs> that is a throwback powerhouse right there. Well done, well done. I uh, so I'm looking forward to this one. Uh, we played them twice that year. They beat us in the playoffs and made seven year old Will cry in the stadium bathroom at a urinal. <laughs> so um, anyway, I'm very much looking forward to this one, and I'm interested to hear your guys's predictions. Well, look, first of all, I want to point out that whenever that photo was taken, I had just started dating my now wife. So let's just put some things in, into perspective here, okay? Um, it's – you don't know what you're going to get with UCA, and I've said this all year. They are truly Jekyll and Hyde out of any of the teams. You know, they've, they've had games like against Missouri State, where is there a matter of special teams that would have given them the dub. You know, they then they've had just games where they, they – I mean, like the Lindenwood game. Okay, I don't mean to harp on that for another week in a row, but the Lindenwood game. So it's really hard to pick this. Well, it's kind of hard to pick this because, you know, UNA has hung in on a lot of their games. Yeah, Kennesaw is not great, but UNA, I mean, they showed what their offense can do. I think UCA has a much better defense though than Kennesaw State. So I'm going to take the Bears at home. Will, you don't have to go cry at a urinal. If they lose, you can go celebrate but I think it's going to be UCA in this one. I think it'll be closer than people think, but I think UCA just has the defense that Kennesaw State didn't, and it will be like a maybe maybe 17-point game. Yeah, I think UCA is going to finally get revenge for that playoff loss against UNA. Um, I think it's going to be a lot like that game, though. I think it's going to be very close, very back and forth. You and I have shown that they can hang, like Rev said, they can hang with the big boys now. They just can't get it done. And I think this is going to be a trend that continues for the rest of the year. Give me the UCA Bears. I hear Central Arkansas produces some of the best men in the nation through that football team. Some great special teamers some powerhouses, and I think that is continuing there. On the stripes, I don't know how this is a question. My Bears 
Absolutely. And I'm big on North Alabama. If you've got Lions on your campus, that's pretty dope. Um, they had those three Division II titles. They're a great program. I was high on them jumping up. I think it's great for the FCS. Not going to be great on the stripes. Bears by a billion. UCA. You uh, you guys are making me nervous with uh, sweeping the sweeping the picks. Uh, hey, I was going to say one thing though. I want before we get to that because you know you did talk about the great players that played on the Central Arkansas team. You know, at least the the long snapper who is on this podcast did not cause four safeties for oh. his team anytime he played. Just want to put that out there. Ooh, that was that was ugly. I I watching that game, I had like secondhand embarrassment. And every time they went out to punt, I was like, guys, just let the quarterback punt the football. Because when a long snapper or a punter or anybody like that gets the yips, it's over. I mean, you, you can't come back from that without like, you know, practicing. <laughs> I just got a great idea. If Joe DeLeon comes to Frisco, we need to have you and Joe in a snap off. Oh God, yeah. That's <laughs> He'll smoke, we already have man. like three built-in mini contests we haven't really told you guys about that are just gonna be super fun and we're gonna live stream. But uh, let's make that the fourth. That would be sweet. He will. He will smoke me. Um, there's a reason I I was the backup snapper and the holder. <laughs> but uh, no, that'll be fun though. I'll do it. Um, but man, this game makes me nervous because uh, UNA has t- like been this close so many times that it's just enough to keep their players invested because how many one and six football teams are there where the players are still putting that amount of like effort and buy-in into a game every week. And because I know what it's like to be on a team, not a college team, but I know what it's like to be on a team that's not good. And it's hard to keep people interested. Like they're just going out there and playing games at this point, but man, they're just that close, and I think uh, they're still bought in. And so you get a team like that that's backed up in a corner, and they're dangerous. And so I was almost hoping they would beat Eastern Kentucky so that they would kind of get that first one out of the way and maybe like, okay. But then at the same time, it's like, well, then if they know how to win, then they're more dangerous. So I don't know. This game scares me a little bit, but uh, we'll see. I will be there, and I'm going to try to find that sign and recreate that picture because I think it's pretty cool. Abilene Christian making the trip to play North Dakota at the United States Postal Service headquarters. Um, God, I should put the logo up there. That's Rev's favorite thing is that they're the USPS. Uh, they're going to the Alaris Center. Um, I, I'll let you guys go first. Uh, actually, Rev, you go first because you, you love the post office. You love the mailman. I do love the mailman of, of, of North Dakota, the the fighting, the fighting postal service. But uh, one thing I want to say, I realized whenever I was talking about the UNA game, I said Kennesaw State, I meant to say Eastern Kentucky. So my apologies to anybody who's going to call me out on that, Jamie Williams. I know you will. But anyway, I digress. Um, North Dakota rarely loses in the Alaris Center. They, it's their, their struggles aren't at home. Their struggles are on the road whenever you see them struggle. Um, you know, and look at their game against South Dakota when they play South Dakota State. I mean, that. I think that was a lot more high scoring than people expected of a game, especially against a defense that's as stout as South Dakota State. Um, Abilene Christian, they are the the Toyota Corolla of the WAC, but they're going to get caught in traffic. I think North uh, North Dakota is going to, they're, they're fighting for a playoff spot. Now they, they are, they, when you look at the Valley, it's going to, that last team is going to come down between them and the Sock Lukies. Um, I think North Dakota takes this and I, uh, I don't, I don't even think it's going to be a close game. I think um, North Dakota beats them by, by 21, at least to be honest with you. Yeah. The fighting Hawks, the only team we all get one on our FCS fans nation podcast that we don't have to wear their gear for. That's mine. Uh, so, but the unbiased Bison admin agrees with everything Dustin said. They are really good at home. They play well there. They're terrible on the road. Um, terrible place to listen to a concert. Um, awful paint job on the outside of that stadium. I'm a big fan of the shopping mall in Fargo and the Fargo Dome in comparison to the Postal Service Center up there in Grand Forks. But I do think UND is going to win this game. So, I'll take the Fighting Hawks and uh, use my logic over my emotion 
and I'll give them the victory. I disagree with both of y'all. Um, if you look at UND's defense, um, their defense compared to Abilene's defense is awful. Awful. Allowing 425 yards at, per game? Like, no. I'm sorry. I am taking I am taking Abilene Christian. Look look at who they've played by comparison. One of them has played a much tougher schedule with a lot more offensive teams than the other one, and that would be North Dakota, not Abilene Christian. The toughest team Abilene Christian has played has been Missouri and CUNF Austin. North Dakota, I mean, UND has played some very, very tough competition. So I would just keep that in mind as you're looking at, at yards because – I think if Abilene Christian played UND's schedule, Abilene Christian's defense would probably give up 550 to 600 yards a game. Like, um, just, I'm just telling you. I'm still taking Abilene Christian because it also plays into what I want to happen the week after this week. <laughs> You're picking with your heart, <laughs> not your head. Okay, and I can afford to pick with my heart with this one. It's not the game of the week. <laughs> yeah, it's not the game of the week, exactly. We can, we, can, we can make picks like that. <laughs> uh, First of all, I... You said the the uh, the shopping mall that is the Fargo Dome. I've never thought about that, but it really does. It even inside, like the walking to the concourse, feels like a shopping mall. Now that you think about it, yeah, and they do events in there, like uh, Big Iron. You got a bunch of tractors in there and farm dealers, and you've got big career <laughs> fairs. And honestly, it's it's a perfect little market inside. Weather's balmy, seventy degrees. Yeah, uh, but I got to give the Alaris Center credit. At least they know how to put in Wi Fi. So. Get with it, bro. Maybe someone will invite you to the FBS if you can put Wi-Fi in a dome. I maybe so. Maybe that's what you need to tell the admin at uh at North Coast State. Sam Houston going to Stephenville to play Tarleton. And man, Sam Houston has been has slipped by uh the skin of their teeth a couple times uh, in the past couple weeks. But I think they could trip up this week. Also, I don't know if I made my pick. I'm picking North Dakota. Um because I think it's pretty clear. But anyway, uh, Sam Houston has uh, really slipped by the last couple weeks, uh, demoted their offensive coordinator. That didn't fix anything. Uh, 18 points, less than 300 yards of offense last week um, against really not a good Utah Tech. So, man, if Tarleton plays how I think they can, um, I think they can beat Sam Houston. But if they play kind of like they did last week against Southwest Baptist, then I think you see St. Houston win another close one, um, which I feel like that's what will happen just because St. Houston, I'm sure, has the better athletes on the team. Um, you got some quarterback issues. but uh, So I'm going to roll with the Bearcats um, just because I think maybe they know how to win, even though their offense sucks. Uh, their defense is pretty good. I'm with you, Will. I actually think this is a type of sexy game on um, homecoming, just uh, the opening of the giant stadium expansion, which is going to be like send us to the FBS. It screams rowdy crowd fun. Let's take down the previous national championships from two years back. And they're also going FBS. That's where we want to be. It just screams the upset. But, man, I look at the results of where Tarleton's been and Mississippi Valley State only beat them 29-13 and two-point win over Southern Utah. It's just not enough evidence for me to say that there's not a talent mismatch. So I'm with you there, Will uh, Siller, which is how you say your last name. Uh, I'll take the Bearcats. It is indeed how you say my last name. Uh, Yeah, I don't know, right? Like, Sam Houston's just bad like i mean they're scraping by and i guess i know they beat sfa that's fine you beat us by one i'm still gonna hate on you because you are scraping by you were tied three three at half against utah tech okay like you're you are i i get that you're not playing for anything this year i get that you've redshirted half of your starters but damn just damn you did not look good it took a 15 point you know quarter and then even then you still almost slipped up at the end of utah tech so i'm gonna take tarleton in this game as much as I don't like Tarleton and I don't give two shits about their stadium expansion, I think it's great that it's going to hold 24,000 people. Too bad you're going to get 10 in there. Um, I, but I, I think this is a game that favors Tarleton a little bit. I think if Bo Allen can move the ball like we think he can, it's, it's going to play well against Sam Houston's defense. 
I think um, if, if the Tarleton defense can shut down Cody Crest, then Sam doesn't have a lot of offensive weapons on that side. I mean, Shoemaker was their top rusher in the game too. So you shut down Shoemaker, you can keep Crest um, – you can keep Crest sort of isolated, and you have a ticket to beating that team. So I'm going to pick the Texans who SFA destroyed because SFA should have destroyed Sam also. But, no, I just, I'm just i really picking against you guys. Who knows? Who cares? It doesn't matter. Both these both these schools are irrelevant in my eyes. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I think this is a pretty evenly matched game. Um, I think the biggest thing, is it actually Tarleton's homecoming? Okay. I think that with the stadium expansion, that's going to play a huge role for Tar- Tar- Tarleton. I'm going to take the Texans. I could see them winning, and I think they have the ability to do it. But, man, Sam Houston has better players, and they have more of those better players than Tarleton does. So... I don't know. That, that, that'll that be interesting. Maybe they will fill that stadium. I don't think they will, but I, mean, I guess when it'll be cool because you're opening it, but I still don't think they'll put 24 in there. All right. It is game of the week time. You, oh, you skipped one. What did I skip? Utah Tech and SFA. But oh. I think we all know who's going to pick that one, so I think we can just... All right. Uh, yeah, game day style picks here. I'm going with the Jacks. Yeah, it's, it's homecoming weekend. We'll go with SFA. <laughs> No need to say it. It's on the screen on YouTube. SFA. Yeah, I'm going SFA. I I keep Utah Tech is kind of the uh, the team that like I thought would. It's kind of like North Alabama. Like I keep thinking they'll break through at some point, but uh, they just haven't. So SFA. Now it's game of the week time. I don't have a cool video like uh, you guys do on the Big Boy Show, but uh, game of the week this week is Eastern Kentucky and Southeast Missouri. Um, this one is interesting, and I want to hear your guys' thoughts before I share mine. Uh, oh, hold on. I think we're going to have a cool video. This is the matchup you should be paying attention to. This is the FCS Fans Nation Game of the Week. That was sick. I feel like I'm. I've made it now. I can... Like, now- we're, now we're hyped. Yeah, I can rest easy now. You know what's um, great? Is, uh, editing programs can make you sound tough when you're really just a small little beanpole in North Dakota. <laughs> it just seem like you have a big booming voice. It's pretty cool. Editing is sweet. <laughs> That's funny. Um, all right. So uh, what do you guys think about uh, Eastern Kentucky and SEMO? Because SEMO comes into this undefeated against the FCS. Uh, only loss being to... Um, the uh, Cyclones of Iowa State, and then EKU, they've shown some glimpses of being really good, and they've shown some glimpses of you know not being great. So um, I'm interested to see see what happens. Anybody can can take it first. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting because the two best teams in the OVC aren't going to play each other at all, and that really does kind of make a little sort of playoff hiccup whenever it comes to the, the I guess to determining their AQ. Um, Simos looked really, really surprisingly damn good this year. Like, I don't think anybody expected them to be this good. And Will, I know you saw them in person, and you you got to see just how well their <laughs> offense goes with uh, Gino Gino Hess and uh, uh, De Laurinas throwing the ball. Um, like, I I I want I want to pick Eastern Kentucky, but I'm not going to because I just don't think they have the defensive capabilities to keep up with the, the Southeast Missouri offense. So I'm going to take Southeast Missouri. I'm going to take them 17 points ish, but that's, that's who we're going with. We're going with SEMO. Uh, I don't see a scenario where SEMO gets beaten this game. Number one, they're at home. Um, you, you could simply just be like, they have a better record. They're the better team, but, you guys said this is game of the weekend. I dove into it a little bit. Look at the wins of SEMO, even in comparison to the games of Eastern Kentucky. It's not even, you know, like the losses and wins of Eastern Kentucky. Their wins are like skin of the teeth. Like they are barely getting by some of these opponents. 
the total offense defense statistics, you know, nationally look better for SEMO. SEMO is probably the team besides Chattanooga nobody is talking about, which is really unfortunate because they're having a great year. I mean, you they, you beat Southern Illinois and everyone just kind of forgot that that whole thing happened. I know they're a little up and down, but they're still a good team that would beat a lot of, you know, teams around the nation and destroying Nichols, you know, beating Central Arkansas by eight points. That's not an easy game to go up against. So I think SEMO is going to win this one. Um, I don't think it'll be a crazy blowout, but I could see maybe a 13 point win. So I'll say SEMO uh, 30. Six Eastern Kentucky at uh, 21, 36, 21, some score like that just for fun. Um, yeah, I SEMO is undefeated at home. Uh, most of their stats, like Matt said, nationally look extremely good for them. Um, I think what's going to play a factor in SEMO is that they are more like their offensive attack is more balanced than EKU. So I think SEMO's defense is going to pick up on that. And it'll be, it'll be like a 17, 20 point win. Uh, give me a uh, SEMO. You know, everybody loves Parker McKinney. I love Parker McKinney. I've said several times, he's my dude. He, uh, he can play Paxton the Lawrence, a heck of a quarterback. Uh, just watching him in person, uh, he, he doesn't look like a mobile guy. Uh, he doesn't look like he's going to run the ball on you, but he can extend plays with his feet. He's thrown for a dang near 2,000 yards, uh, only three interceptions, 17 touchdowns. Geno Hess is a heck of a running back. Um, he's hard to tackle. That was one thing I noticed uh, when we played uh, there in Cape Girardeau was, man, his yards after contact was uh, – pretty impressive he's up to almost um a thousand yards already so they uh and like you said they've just played better they've won better games and played better games than eastern kentucky has so yeah i'm gonna roll with semo i think it'll be close though i think eastern kentucky plays uh people close and so i think it'll be more like a uh 10 10 point game is what i'll say so uh, i think we're all in agreement there which sucks because it means i can't make any ground up uh on on the rev in the uh, game of the week standings i know um which we didn't update this week because we all missed it so not a big deal but uh that about wraps us up for tonight and uh matt thank you for coming on we had a great time um if you're not already subscribed to the fcs fans nation network youtube channel make sure you do that below uh, Rev always points to it. He's not pointing to it right now, but there we go. Uh, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Uh, that keeps this thing going. But uh, Matt, since you are get I'm with you and Lucas off. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. I listen to your show um, as I get my drive times throughout the week on uh, the work weeks. You guys have been such a great addition to the FCS Fans Nation Network. It's pretty cool. Um, I think in a era and time where people just want to go viral and create content and blast things to the moon or whatever. I think it's really awesome that a big group of, uh, you know, friends through social media and now Frisco and meetings are just a collective of podcasts for just stuff we love and like, like this is genuinely the, probably the most natural grassroots movement of like a podcast format that I've kind of heard of in the last three, four years, because we just don't have expectations with it. We don't take corporate sponsors. We don't reach out to try to do all these things. Yeah, we have like a few things we do here and there just for fun, but we've got to really believe in anything we're doing. We're not in this for the money. Um, when FCS Fans Nation, the podcast started, it was the admins on the page saying literally, hey, we don't even know what each other's voices sound like. Why don't we do a podcast just so we can talk to each other as friends instead of texting all the time? And that's how it started. And really, that's what it is now. Uh, we're, you know, I love group messaging with you guys and talking with you guys through text message, planning Frisco, seeing you guys on Twitter and everything. So if you're not subscribed to the FCS Fans Nation Network, um, expand your mindset a little bit to listen about the Wax On and listen about the Grizz. And there's lots of cool podcasts out there. But just know that it's backed up by great people like Brandon, Will and Dustin here who are like, we love the ASUN and we love our teams. We love football. So we're just going to talk about it. So that will always trend better with people who actually care. So 
I uh, really appreciate you guys being on the network. You guys mean a lot to us and me. So keep doing big things. And thanks for putting out content I can listen to amongst my quiet drives where my three kiddos are off at, at daycare while I'm on my way to work. So appreciate y'all. All right. We appreciate you being on. So uh, what's up, Rev? Where's the boom? We're waiting on the yeah, boom. No, the I was boom. waiting to hit the end record we're button. The boom. We're going to oh, end with the to, boom. Oh, I didn't this know is, you wanted me to do the finale. You, oh, yeah. You always end with the boom. It's what the guests do, unless you're Nathan McCree and getting us on hype videos. So, oh, man. Yeah. Well, I messed up the audio in the beginning, so it was only <laughs> mess up the ending. But, ladies and gentlemen, you have listened to the Wax Sun podcast. And whether you were revved up for last week's game or you're cocky about your team next week or you're ready for a long snap into the playoffs, Thanks for joining us. We'll catch you next week. Boom.